Great. Uh, thank you very much, James. Thank you very much, Anna. Great pleasure to be here. Always been a firm supporter of drug science since it started all those years ago when I contributed to David getting sacked from the ACMD by providing a paper about MDMA psychotherapy for the Home Secretary, which they didn't like. So um, drug science is a big thing for me. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking to you about this uh, treatment for alcohol use disorder using MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. I'll, sp I'll speak for about 15 or 20 minutes and then we can do some questions. Um, so what, why do I do this work? Why am I interested in psychedelics? I think there's something significantly wrong with contemporary psychiatry. Um, we're stuck in a wholly biological psychiatric model for the last 40 years. Um, and I would say that we are in mental health services where we were with general medicine 100 years ago. When we were very good at medical epidemiology, we knew who got smallpox and tuberculosis and those infectious diseases, but we hadn't discovered antibiotics and we were poor at treating things. And of course, the um, pharmaceutical industry queues up to give us these daily maintenance medications that you take to mask symptoms, but not quite get better. So we have a lot of work to do to turn this around in mental health services. And th frankly, this is not good enough. This is poor. Um, I can't think of any other branch of medicine that would accept the kind of poor outcomes we're used to in psychiatry. Indeed, psychiatry has become this kind of palliative care industry where psychiatrists themselves are learned helpless. And uh, we, we, we don't use the C word, the cure word, that is. Um, we don't believe we can cure people. We just get alongside them for life, giving them daily maintenance treatments. And that is quite simply not good enough. And so where are we going wrong? Well, essentially, where is our antibiotic? Where is our drug that gets to the heart of the cause of mental health problems and doesn't just treat things symptomatically? Um, and you can see where I'm going here. It's the psychedelics and in my opinion, particularly MDMA. Now, in terms of treatments to using psychedelics for addictions, um, very rich history, particularly with the classic psychedelics. Indeed, the majority of work done with LSD psychotherapy in the 50s and 60s was with alcoholism. And um, what, what they found was that uh, by inducing this mystical, spiritual, psychotic, if you like, experience with LSD, you um, created this natural tendency towards sobriety. And a lot of the work was done here in uh, at this, this place in Canada um, by uh, Humphrey Osmond and his team. Um, this, uh, the work of the Canadian psychiatrists using LSD psychotherapy was, was a study by a meta-analysis by Terry Krebs and Pal Johansson um, in 2012, and they found a very strong positive effect size for the use of LSD psychotherapy to treat addictions, particularly alcohol addiction. So there's a well-established history here. Indeed, a part of the history that you might not know about, Bill Wilson, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous himself, was actually keen on LSD and he had five or six important LSD experiences. And when he talks about the higher power in the um, 12 steps, he's talking about LSD. Of course, that, that part of the history has been kind of eradicated from the AA um, 12 steps these days, but it's interesting to bear in mind that um, even AA is influenced by LSD in the early days. Um, and in modern times, uh, psilocybin, which is generally favoured over LSD for contemporary classic psychedelic drug studies, has been shown as a useful treatment for alcohol addiction. This is Michael Bogenschutz, who was very uh, supportive of us in designing our MDMA study. And he found, much like the work of the 50s, that patients that had this intense psychospiritual experience had uh, much higher rates of abstinence. So it's, uh, it's effective with, with classic psychedelics. Now, when thinking about trauma and addiction, you, you, the two things are very, very linked, which is um, I'm, I'm interested as a child and adolescent psychiatrist in the concept of um, attachment disorder and also child abuse and maltreatment. Um, and I always say, don't take your eye off the ball when it comes to emotional abuse and neglect. Um, childhood trauma is not just physical or sexual abuse, the, the social services stuff. Um, so many patients describe just a poor experience of childhood, which has profound effects on the development of their psyche and their subsequent social and uh, health functioning. And of course, our patients in mental health have, have many multiple risk factors. We tend to work with people on the bottom rung of the ladder, people with transgenerational unemployment, racism, exclusion, poor housing. Um, if I wasn't a doctor, my second choice was to become a social worker. Um, I think if we could just improve the healthcare for unmarried, uh, rather, sorry, not unmarried, single mothers, 
children under five, we could empty the prisons and hospitals overnight. So um, give up psychiatry and join social work if you really want to help people. Um, a little bit of a uh, physiolog physiology lesson here. So the red area there is the amygdala, very primitive part of the human brain, responds to fear and stress. It's what we call a bottom-up reaction. No thought is required. In response to a stressful environment, your amygdala fires and triggers a hormonal response called fight, flight, freeze. Um, and, a, and a couple of seconds later, a couple of nanoseconds later, that green area, the prefrontal cortex kicks in. And this can override the amygdala effect. And you can use judgment and rational, logical reasoning to overcome that fear response. Um, it's a very important neuroadaptive neuro response to fear. Now, if you expose a child to trauma, big T or little t trauma, and they're constantly fearful, then you're going to develop a physical brain change in your pre-verbal infant years, um, in which you have excessive hyper amygdala response. You find things more frightening than others, and you have a, frun a shrunken prefrontal response. You um, do not, it's not so good, easy to talk yourself out of pain and trauma. And then you'd go into adulthood with this brain change in which the development of addictions and particularly post-traumatic stress disorder become apparent. Um, and it's all about this identity formation. If you're lucky enough to be loved and cared for and played with and praised, you develop a very positive self-narrative about yourself and a positive world narrative that people are good and they'll be trusted and they'll look after you. If you have an insecure attachment, it's very often you develop these very negative self and world narratives. And it's very hard to tackle these once, once they're formed. They're not absolutely rigid. If that was the case, I'd be out of a job, but they are very, very rigid and it's difficult to shift them. And the easiest thing to do is simply numb yourself, block out the world with dangerous drugs such as heroin or even more dangerous drugs such as alcohol, which is why people with trauma so often go towards these compounds. Now, it's difficult to treat trauma and addictions. There's no single drug. We treat them symptomatically. If they're depressed, give them an antidepressant. If they can't sleep, give them a hypnotic. If their mood goes up and down, give them a mood stabilizer. If their hypervigilance becomes um, paranoid, give them an antipsychotic. None of these drugs treat the cause. They are all symptomatic daily maintenance, papering over of symptoms. And of course, high rates of self-harm and suicide and high rates of substance misuse, which, why, which is why we associate um, addictions with trauma so frequently. Now, 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine uh, is a quite remarkable molecule. And um, we didn't know whether it would work for addictions. Uh, the vast majority, in fact, all except one studies to date with MDMA have been to treat post-traumatic stress disorder where it has very positive results. But what MDMA lacks that the classic psychedelics don't um, um, have is this mystical spiritual experience. All of that work in, with LSD in the 60s, 50s and 60s, and the more recent psilocybin studies by Bogenschutz or uh, Matt Johnson with nicotine addiction, um, they've all found that the psychospiritual experience is what works. Now, MDMA doesn't traditionally do that, but it does work with trauma and empathy, which led us on to our study. Indeed, I would suggest that MDMA is the perfect tool to assist trauma psychotherapy. It's safe, it's short acting, and it enhances empathy and provides this painful, uh, this, this access to these painful traumatic memories. Um, works across multiple receptors at the 1A and 1B serotonin receptors. You've got this reduction in anxiety and depression. It's positively felt mood. Uh, mild effect at the 2A receptors where the classic psychedelics work, but not, not with a great sense of ego dissolution and, and uh, distortion of uh, perceptions as you get with the classic psychedelics. Then you've got this paradoxical effect between the dopamine and noradrenaline and the alpha one and two activities where, and those of you who are familiar with the drug ecstasy, you may recognize this bizarre feeling of being both speeded up and slowed down at the same time, which puts you in the perfect um, uh, arousal zone for psychotherapy. And then of course, there's a hormonal effect with the release of oxytocin, which as you know, is the hormone released from the brains of breastfeeding mothers that engenders a sense of empathy and bonding. So when you add up all these things together, what MDMA does so beautifully and so uniquely pharmacologically is it inhibits the fear response. But crucially, the other faculties are left intact. This is very important. Many drugs reduce the fear response. A bottle of vodka effectively reduces the fear response. A bag of heroin effectively reduces the fear response, which is why people with trauma and addictions end up moving towards these drugs. 
Um, but MDMA does it so cleanly. All the other faculties are intact. You can think, you can remember, you can debate, you can talk about your childhood, you can walk around, you can make a cup of tea, um, all kinds of things you can't do with many other drugs. So it makes it absolutely perfect for combining with trauma-focused psychotherapy. And there's our um, traumatized brain, a child who's been exposed to trauma with these physical brain changes, this hyper amygdala response, this shrunken prefrontal response. And under MDMA, we see the exact opposite. The amygdala response is massively shrunken and there is a boosting of the prefrontal cortex response. You are able to see the good in things, see the good in yourself. You're able to think positively and think forward as opposed to in a state of fear. So remarkable drug. Now here is our team, um, David Nutt there and Michael Mithoffer, um, who's a pioneer of uh, MDMA therapy for PTSD in the States. What we designed was an open label safety and tolerability course. So no, no control group, no placebo group. And I, I hear you shouting, that's not very methodologically sound, um, but indeed that's what you have to do when you come up with a new drug in a new condition for the first time. You have to start with what's called a safety and tolerability study. Um, so the structure of the course, um, patients underwent a detox to become down to zero alcohol use. After the detox, they then came into our eight week psychotherapy course, which um, like many uh, psychedelic protocols, they only take the drug on a, a couple of occasions, um, sandwiched between non-drug sessions for preparation and in integration. And then we followed them up for nine months thereafter. Um, this is, um, I like this table because it's spectacularly boring and says absolutely nothing, which is exactly what we wanted because these are all our measures of safety and tolerability. No changes in bloods, no changes in ECG, no, no suicides, no low affect, everyone tolerated the experience um, and there were no serious adverse events um, associated with the medication. So uh, as I said, spectacularly boring, but exactly the results we needed in a safety and tolerability study. Um, so MDMA is remarkably safe. Um, you know, I've been talking about MDMA for 15 years and I used to put up all sorts of graphs of safety and holes in the brain and neurodegenerative problems. And I just don't bother anymore. It's, uh, we have a 30 year history of heavy ecstasy use in this country. MDMA is not on the radar as a, a drug that causes um, a public health concern or has significant safety risks. And any safety issues that do occur are easily manageable within the context of a clinical setting. So I can certainly answer more questions on that, but essentially MDMA is not recreational ecstasy. So nevertheless, the ethics committee in their wisdom asked us to monitor carefully physiological changes during the eight week, uh, the eight hour session. And as you can see, you get the expected mild transient rise in blood pressure, temperature and pulse. Uh, you get the rise in drug effects, which is the green arrow there, and a reduction in anxiety, which is the SUDS effect, subjective unit of uh, distress. Um, and that all stayed within normal limits. So we all tick the box there. Um, people often ask me this, what about come downs? What about I don't know what ravers are calling it these days. I'm extremely old. My raving days are long gone. Um, what about Blue Monday, Black Tuesday, Suicide Wednesday, or whatever people talk about? Um, well, we simply did not see this. No patients experienced come downs. They all beautifully slipped into a lovely sleep at the end of the day. And we measured their affect for seven days after each of the MDMA sessions. And these are the pooled results of the profile of mood states questionnaire. Um, any scores below zero, so zero means normal mood. Anything above zero would be depression. Anything below zero is not only not depression, it's actually a positively felt mood. So what you see here is far from there being a Black Monday, Blue Tuesday, we have an afterglow effect that lasts for the week. And these are the pooled results of 26 sessions. So that kind of blows out of the water this concept of MDMA has a come down and MDMA causes post affect drop, post MDMA affect drop. And I can talk a bit more about that if anyone wants to ask any specific questions. Um, so, how do we do with drinking? Whilst, you know, whilst 
the drinking behavior was not a primary outcome measure because it wasn't an efficacy study. We nevertheless obviously looked at drinking. Now, before we looked, before we did the MDMA study, we did um, what's effectively a sort of loose control group. It's actually a treatment as usual group. We looked at 12 patients undergoing detoxes in Bristol. You can see there when they all came in before screening, they were all drinking an average of 159 units of alcohol a week. They all dropped down to zero at the point of their detox. And then without an MDMA intervention, we observed them over the next nine months. And as you can see, their, their rates of relapse gradually creeped up to pretty much where they were before um, after nine months after their detox. And this is a pretty typical result. Um, treatment of alcoholism is so poor. We were doing better at treating alcoholism in Victorian times than we are today. So that's what we were dealing with. Um, now, here is the results of the... MDMA study, um, 130 units a week on average pre-detox, came down to zero at the point of detox, and then we measured them. Uh, they then got the eight-week MDMA-assisted psychotherapy course, and there are the rates of drinking in terms of units per week on average across the 14 patients at nine months. And now, ready for the drum roll, this is what I call the money shot. Ta-da! Um, now, that is a quite staggering result. That's what I call a Mithoffer type result. Um, we have to bear in mind, this is a non-controlled, non-placebo controlled, non-randomized study. Um, so you can't statistically compare those two lines, but they really do speak for themselves. The black line there is the current best treatments for people undergoing detox in Bristol. And the red line is the outcomes that occurred with our MDMA assisted psychotherapy treatment. And as I said, we cannot separate the MDMA from the wonderful therapists um, and it might just, just be the therapists, but um, it seems far too good to just be that. And obviously it asks the question that we need to do a randomized control study to um, uh, test MDMA against placebo um, and therefore demonstrate its uh, active effect pharmacologically. Um, few um, qualitative uh, reports there. Patients tolerated the therapy very well. Um, most of these patients had been through multiple detoxes. They've been in and out of rehab. Uh, they've been sectioned into hospital. They've attempted to take their life. They've been on anti-craving drugs. They've, they've taken everything that modern medicine can throw at them. Um, and they were very much overawed by how successful MDMA was. Um, so why is this so difficult to get going? You know, these are some of the objections to psychedelics clinically. Well, you can't swap one dangerous drug for another. That's an absurd thing to say. There are very few things that are more dangerous in life than drinking a bottle of vodka a day. So that's rubbish. The risk of addiction to psychedelics, that's also rubbish. Um, psychedelics have a very low addiction um, uh, risk. Uh, you don't see drug seeking behavior with MDMA or psilocybin, people don't go out robbing in order to get some magic mushrooms. Doesn't happen, they, we don't see them in drug services. Uh, lack of research efficacy, that's absolutely not true. Indeed, every single one of the psychedelic studies of the last 15 years have been spectacular results. They really have. Sends the wrong message, read drug policy. I threw that one in for David because that is quite clearly a load of rubbish. The message should be the truth, not any preconceived ideas from successive governments um, pushing a unpleasable, unethical and dangerous drug policy. Costly and difficult, yes. And erroneous and stigmatizing public perception, yes. These are our challenges and barriers. So we are at the stage now where I'm about to open the world's first medical psychedelic clinic here in Bristol. It's, um, that's me standing outside our really impressive building. It's currently a bit of a building site. Anyone in Bristol, do drop in and I'll take you around there. Um, we've got a superb stellar scientific advisory team with man, Michael and Annie Mithoffer and Celia Morgan, who's a, uh, an international expert on ketamine, Matt Johnson there from uh, the Johns Hopkins University, and myself and David. So um, we, are, we have some great plans lying ahead with our therapy service there. Um, yeah, there's our building site and we're working on that right now. It's looking beautiful. And Sigmund Freud would have loved this. He would have loved the idea of combining medication with psychotherapy. He wasn't such a pure psychoanalyst. He was actually a neurologist. So who knows what might have happened had Freud stuck around. And I think I will stop there. Thank you. Very much.